Um, and today, what we want to do is present one of the, the works we built recently, Henry VR, which was exhibited at the Art Gallery of New South Wales uh, for about five months, I think it was. It was a long run. Mm -hmm. um, and it ended recently, and it was the Art Gallery's first virtual reality exhibition. So we get, a, we get a bit of a pat on the back for that, yeah, I think. Yeah, I've done quite well. We do apologise for the flickering screen. It's, um, we'll just pursue and get through it. So please bear with us. Cool. Well, what I really want to talk about, what I'm, I'm interested in, is how VR and immersive environments can be adapted for the core uses of museology and fine art. Uh, in this particular case, it was an exhibition about a Tudor painting of Henry VIII that's in the Art Gallery's collection, which is a unique thing because there are very few portraits of Henry VIII, uh, let alone any Tudor paintings in Australia at all. So what Henry VR was is a serious game that visualised the kind of the world that, um, in which the painting was created. Um, and it was a, a conservation science exhibition, but it was also about uh, positioning the gallery as a kind of living document, a living history in which people were players. Um, so I did the, the visualisation on it. Mm -hmm. and um, I did the uh, mechanics, um, any graphics that we did, um, and sort of testing and... Um, also working on um, a little bit of help with the setup itself, the exhibition space. Yep. So this is a little bit more about us. I'm a uh, postdoc at uh, kind of mad science visualization arts. We are lab. a little bit weird. <laughs> I'm perfectly fine. She's oh, weird. No, She's no, a no. dev. No, She's no, no. like he's, just he's normally just weird. She's just as weird as me. Um, I'm a research fellow. I, I do um, sort of, you know, historical uh, experimental art research as well. I do the 3D design at uh, the iCinema Centre and we, where we engineer these big visualisations. And where we met. Where we met. Nicola used to be a, a research engineer there. Mm -hmm. So um, at the moment, I am a freelance uh, VR developer. Now, my background, actually, I'm an industrial designer that um, turned to game dev programming. So I have a bit of an interesting background. So yes, I worked at iCinema with Andrew for, what, a year? Mm. Yeah, and um, I've worked on a few other digital and VR works with Andrew and without. I also um, do VR UX design, and um, yeah, so I usually let Andrew do kind of like the writing and the talking and the meetings, and I tend to just handle more technical bits and pieces. That's definitely how we roll. So we're, we've worked a few things together. We've got like, we've got a business partnership going here. It's good. <laughs> Um, okay, so Henry VR. So what is this thing? So this began actually as an experimental visualisation uh, research project in conservation science. His child. It is. Uh, it was child. about this, this painting of Henry VIII, uh, which was very, very damaged and in the collection of the Art Gallery of New South Wales, and there were kind of provenance issues about it. We didn't know much about it. Um, there were questions about whether it was related to this set of other paintings in London, but there were mysteries around it. So it was kind of like a fake or fortune style project, if any of you have seen it, that show. Um, so in this kind of case, like there was very few, little information about this kind of, this era of English painting because most of the records were destroyed in the Great Fire of London. So we only had the painting to work with. So what we did was we took it to the particle accelerator down here in Melbourne called the Australian Synchrotron. It's pretty cool. Which, is, which does what particle accelerators does, mm. you know. It's like the, the small hadron collider. Mm -hmm. And through that, we were able to run it through this thing called the X-ray fluorescence microscopy beam line to produce these really, really, really beautiful, this beautiful image archaeology mm. of the painting itself that maps the elemental layers of the painting. So we were able to see what was original and non-original material. We were able to... Uh, the wood it was painted on? The wood, we were able to yeah. figure out that the wood was chopped down in about 1520 in a, wood, in a uh, forest uh, in the uh, county of Kent. Like things like that. We were able to re-piece together the historical context, the material context for how this painting was created um, using the particle accelerator, mm. which is, which is kind of cool. And that formed the basis of the scientific data which Nicola was able to mm. um, visualise in point cloud form. Yep. Um, so the challenge for us were, was how do, you, how do you tell the story of this painting um, when you have no other contextual material in an art gallery? Um, how do you convey really, really complex scientific data in a way that your grandmother and your child 
can understand at the same time. And in the gallery context, how can we use uh, embodied immersive realities to convey uh, understanding of history in you know, ways that aren't hitting you over the head with a boring textbook? Yep. How do we do that? I don't know. What's the next slide? <laughs> <laughs> So this was, um, so basically meetings, they were mainly Andrew. Um, you went to the art gallery so many times to organise so many things. Mm. Um, I was involved in maybe two of those, which was great. Um, so we had to really um, discuss and really convince the art. Like, I think they were on board, but they had to be a bit more convinced, which you did brilliantly. <laughs> well done, you. Bribes. Yep. Yeah, bribes. Um, and so I had to work out um, how on earth we did this VR exhibition, but I think we got a pretty good setup myself in how we did it. So, yeah, you did a lot of research on Tudor. Um, so I had to get those scans. Thank you, Andrew, got them for me. Um, I made a point glad converter in Python, which is not Unity related, but I have a link to it later. Um, so I converted the 2D images into 3D with, um, I used depth, map depth mapping as well. And um, so we used, because uh, we were short on time, we basically had what, I had two months of full-time work on this and then dribs and drabs after that. So I went, we had Steam VR um, to, with the interactivity as the basis. So normally I would say go open VR if you've got more time, but didn't. So I'm just trying to remember. Yeah, so I also was considering security and accessibility. So um, we'll show you some more shots of the um, space itself, like the actual exhibit exhibition space, we had paintings from the same period as that Henry portrait, and they were quite close to the exhibition space. So there was a problem with, if we let people just run amok with a VR headset, they're going to hit them, and that's a massive liability. So we um, worked out a way. So we should also just like talk, tell you what the actual experience is. So when you put on the headset, you go inside um, a reconstruction of what we think a Tudor era artisan studio was. Yeah. So as Nicola was saying, we did a lot of research into the kinds of materials and uh, architectures of the time from the very, very, very little we know about um, craftsmen in 16th century London. It was quite hard. We had to do a bit of guesswork. So I went mm. off um, like the way painters used to paint before we had electricity in terms of they used a hell of a lot of light and were very open, which is quite difficult in a Tudor period when you had buildings that you didn't have the technology to have large windows. So we made all the assets from uh, whatever was surviving. So museum, uh, museum collections of Tudor furniture, uh, architecture that survives that, we, that I created a, like a one-to-one -one scale um, reconstruction. Uh, all the furniture was period. The art materials we got, uh, like things like the brushes and the, the um, panels and things were from uh, Italian and Dutch records of how artists worked at the time. And so as close as possible, we tried to make the material experience, like the sort of sensory experience, uh, a kind of, um, you know, immersively authentic as we could. So that also uh, involved creating a whole bunch of PBR materials to describe yeah. how light goes off a gesso plaster that's been mixed with animal fat, things like that. This guy did all the lighting, so, yeah. Which I kind of let you loose on because you're good at that stuff. Uh, so here you can see a wireframe of the actual... Yeah. that that um, we made in planning the exhibition. So it was in this little 19th century gallery in the it's corner. It's a very small space um, compared to the rest of the gallery. Like you think of an art gallery being like a huge space, but this is just what's called a court. And it's a sort of little off section. Um, how big is it? About six metres by four? Yeah, it's not very big. Um, and the challenge, yeah. I challenge was, I guess, trying to fit trying to fit a virtual reality mm. installation play space into a 19th century gallery with really, really heavy architecture. But we did it. So, um, so yeah, we had to. We didn't. We did have to blend the installation into the area. But what we did was we made it look really futuristic in the area. So we made it stand out. What we had were um, we used the door, the actual doorway into the court, as like a portal to see out the door in when you're in the Tudor studio, studio to see out into the world. So kind of a connection with the real court and then the virtual world, which was pretty cool. And um, we actually ended up with two stations um, within the space. So we took up two corners um, and we used two um, HTC Vives with um, only one set of base stations because it was such a small enough space, made sense. And obviously more base stations is a problem. Well, in that um, version of the Vive. 
So it was um, pretty interesting. So I will go over um, later on about um, the poorly understood part of VR in um, our galleries. But the point was we wanted to try to make it a theatrical experience yes. where when you step through this doorway, it was like, you know, going through, uh, going through the, the cupboard into Narnia or going, yeah, through, yeah. you know, platform nine or th like nine three quarters. Like a kind of an experience when you um, also stepped between um, the virtual Tudor world to the virtual modern world where you could see the restoration of the painting. So we had two different experiences you could go through. Yeah, so this is one of, this is actually when we were setting up this picture. Um, so obviously the lighting is incorrect because we had to see what we were doing. Um, so you can see that's one of the corners and there's the picture of um, Henry VIII. So just behind this picture, there's the other base station. I mean, the other like um, station six. So we, sorry to cut you off, Andrew, um, to tether people in place. Um, we obviously have that floor space, so that square you can stand on. So that's only where they can play in VR and you can feel the difference if you go over the edge with their feet over the cunt seat. I've also got a bungee system to make sure they actually feel their head isn't going any further. So they get kind of a pull. I will talk about that a little bit more because this was the first setup. And um, we only use the trigger on the HTC Vive controllers because from our experience with previous works when people haven't been too experienced with VR headsets and controllers, they definitely understood the trigger first. So we only used the trigger and it was basically like you hit the trigger to pick up and let go to let go. Very, very simple. So you can see that we built this um, a kind of a black, an open black cube, mm. an open face black cube. Um, so when you looked through the, um, the, the doorway into the ex exhibition space from the front, you only saw the painting. The room was very, very dark yes. and the paintings were just sort of lit. But when you looked obliquely through the door, you could see that black play space and it looked like, uh, looked like the Unity logo. Looked like, it looked like um, an isometric cube, and that's what it was designed to do. It was designed to evoke the, um, the, the uh, physical sensation of looking at a 3D object uh, in a very, very um, heavy 19th century environment. So again, to sort of condition the, um, the user's behavior before they got to the installation itself. Now, so we had the two ones. Um, we also had on each one a screen, so you could see what each person was doing. And these um, experiences in the two setups were exactly the same. Um, obviously, people would be at different stages depending on when they started. That's fine. Um, and you, with the court being so small, we would have one host that would guide people through the experiences, but we were allowed to control the amount of people that could go in there at any time, which was really good because we wanted to avoid people just bumbling into the VR setup when someone was in there and accidentally get hit. So... People were actually really good about that, I found. They didn't tend to kind of run around in the room and act like an idiot until they got into VR. Some people still very much equate VR with games. They, um, we had to organise with the host a little bit better guidance on, hey, this isn't... You're in an art gallery, please treat the space and the VR experience with the respect you would treat the rest of the art gallery. So once we actually changed that wording, um, people stopped acting like idiots. Like, it was mainly teenagers, let's be honest, but people stopped being stupid and spinning around. And in, ge in general, they're very well <laughs> behaved, all right? They're generally yeah. very well behaved. But, yeah, we did have some issues which we will explain. So... Uh, the thing is that it, it, okay. in integrating it with the, the actual space, the hosts weren't there to tell you how to play the serious mm -hmm. game. No. All they did was onboard the, um, the, the, the users, so the mechanics of how you put the thing on, and then helped with contextual historical information about the exhibition experience. So all of the, the experience itself was all self-directed. There, no, there, like, there was no sort of like um, linear level progression. You could pick up objects from the artisan's table and you would hear how that particular object uh, was manipulated to create the, um, the, the painting. And then as you manipulated them, you would get this beautiful data visualization that Nicola will show you in a sec. Mm -hmm. The whole idea is that there were no instructions and you could have a meaningful experience just by standing in the Tudor space, looking out the door and seeing the living London around you, you know, the, the, the tides going in and out on the Thames, the creeks of the, the dock, yeah. the little, the little people, people who I walked people around. AI, um, paths just going past. Randomly. Lots and lots of Easter eggs. If you looked out the window, you could see uh, a model of uh, the 16th century iteration of London Bridge. You could see markets. There were all these tiny little details. There was a cat sleeping on the dock for no, yeah, exactly. For no, <laughs> for no other reason than it's fun to find them. And so there were some people who actually didn't 
um, put together what, what Nicola's going to show you and still came out of it thinking that was incredible because the idea was there's a different, different sensory ways of, uh, of experiencing and creating meaning from uh, historical encounters. Mm -hmm. So now I'm going to go on to the technic more technical bits. So we haven't even said you could actually go inside the particle accelerator. Yeah, you could as there well. There was an Easter egg that, yeah. that if you touch this microscope. There was this microscope that was out of place. And yeah, if you even you didn't have to even click on it. You just touched it. It would take you to um, the kind of the synchrotron. Inside course. a particle accelerator where you could see the recolored fluorescence maps, which are beautiful. Yeah. And then you could watch a documentary in VR that we cut about the, the process. From the um, yeah. head restorer. Yeah. So, so it's possible to come back again there, and again and again there. and just Everyone's sort of like find things. Giggling. Yeah. Um, okay, yeah, so um, with the technical stuff, as I said before, I use SteamVR, so I'm going to be very clear, I used 1.2.3. Um, we built it in Unity 2017.2. So now, um, I was going to show you all my wonderful classes and how I set it up, and then I went and looked at SteamVR plugin version 2, and I looked at their interactivity example, particularly hands.cs, so their hands.cs file, which basically is another version of what I made a few months ago. So I'm not going to show you my code, but I will give you a link to it if you need to. So what I did was I was using Steam VR Track Controller, which if you've looked at version 2.0.1, you'll notice it's now gone. So there's a whole different input system. Um, that's why I'm not going to explain it, because it's fairly redundant. But if you're use, still using version 1.2.3 of the plugin, then you can go and look at my code. So I basically had the Track Controller um, was inherited by my controller interactivity class and that would then um, obviously when it like I use colliders um, to pick up objects the objects would have special scripts on them so I had like a basic object interactivity script and then different other scripts that would build on that that inherited from the base class and so I'd have like for example the um, microscope was one that only when you um, just touched it, didn't pick it up, it would activate something, but then the objects, for example, we had a, like a bone skull you could play with on the table. That was a different one where you could pick it up. And then also the point clouds were a different one again where they had a very um, localised movement, only in kind of one um, direction. So yeah, there was all different things. So I also, um, I have some UI on the controller to kind of give people names of things because some things didn't make sense. Um, like they didn't really know what Cinnabar was. It's actually what, Mercury? Yeah, a version of Mercury. Um, so I labeled it Cinnabar and yeah, that showed that, oh look, the red section in the painting is from this. So, okay. Now, this is the video. Um, how can I make it play? Please play. Can I play? Play, please play. Okay, here we go. So this is just from um, the testing stage. Obviously, we didn't have the actual objects. So you can kind of see the particles, and then they form, oh, thank you, Blink. Um, they form the point cloud. And then you were able to see which point cloud you had, and then pull it out. So I made it look a little bit like a book, because I figured people at least understood what books are, even though they've never been in VR before. And I gave little tabs in case they wanted to grab the tab. But most people just kind of went in and went, oh, and then kind of realized they could pull it out and see the different layers. That was pretty fun. So what that's actually imaging, with our nerd hats on, is yeah. the density of that particular element. Mm. So if you pick up this cinnabar, which, which Nicola was saying before, which is a poisonous rock from which they ground mercury, which was then used to create the red colour, the vermilion, which is in the flesh, which you can see in the picture there. Um, it would materialise into this beautiful, um, there would be this, you know, like particle effect, and then uh, the density of mercury and vermilion on the painting surface would visualise as that, and it's a, a, a 3D mesh, point cloud. And then you can pull them out, you can actually walk through them, mm. and it's kind of like this magical, charming um, data visualization again, which you sort of, you don't, it's not over explained, it's just about you getting an embodied sense of the fact that there is some sort of correlation between material and um, a, an image. Mm -hmm. So it's not a historical simulation, obviously, but it's this idea that you can have like a sensory authenticity and take from that meaning about the world that you've um, visualised. Yeah. Okay. So now, um, so if you want to have a look at my code, I do actually have the point cloud um, Python tool. I also have obviously the interactivity script and um, something else that we'll explain at the end. Um, you can get onto my GitHub and look at all of them. Um, if you miss this, just come and talk to me later. I'll give you a link. 
And yeah, so like I said, version two, my interaction system is redundant until I may be updated if I get time. So I'd recommend if you're using version two, you go to their interaction, um, interactivity example scene and then look up the hands um, C sharp script and that will give you um, the best way to do it. So yeah, moving forward, let's follow, yeah, Valve's example. So, um, oh, that, that change has been quite big, but it's good. Oh, that, remember the mouse isn't my mouse. Yeah. Okay, okay, so what do we, what yeah. do, what do we, we learn? Learned. We, learned, we learned a lot, actually, yeah. because as Jeez. I said, this was the first time that the Art Guide of New South Wales had had um, a virtual reality installation. Um, the picture you see there, there was a nice visit from Sir Fraser Stoddart, who just won the Nobel Prize in Chemistry. Um, and he came and, and had a play, which was, which was a, a really lovely, uh, lovely thing to happen. But overall, we had really excellent um, visitor feedback. Um, the Art Gallery is a little bit of a challenging place to have this kind of installation because you can imagine that the visitation, the demographics a little bit older. Mm. But we had people from like five, um, you know, up until their mid eighties come and do it. And we had very, very good written feedback as well as just sort of like verbal feedback given to the hosts. Um, and what it allowed us to do as well is communicate all this kind of like scientific and art historical research that goes on at the gallery behind the scenes. And importantly, we were able to take this painting, which is 500 years old, which was never exhibited um, because it was like a collection orphan. There was nothing yeah. else in Australia that, that, that was, you know, its relation. Um, it allowed us to take this lost kind of like gem of English history and exhibit it by situating it in context in virtual reality. Mm. So it's a really good example of how you can broaden the, the um, role and function of a museum, uh, especially in a fine arts museum that doesn't like tech, mm. uh, using, using sympathetic immersive environments. Okay. And so this um, was where more, not so much negatives, but opportunities <laughs> change. So um, we did find that um, I found one host was probably not enough for big groups and things would get a little bit out of control and the bits and pieces would break quite easily. So yeah, we, the audio straps were breaking. Um, we also had the, so those are the um, add-on um, headphones you can buy for this, the Vive. Um, we also found the cable um, was getting twisted up inside and breaking internally, which we had to replace. Um, I actually built a custom bungee that was a bit heavier than the, um, just the regular cord, because I obviously started out with the regular cord. We swapped to this heavier bungee, which people would just feel the heaviness of the bungee and realise that they can't spin around, like they need to kind of stay still. And with the host changing their, um, the way they explained the situation and the experience helped. So everything, everything adds together. You've got to kind of manage expectations the whole way through. Yeah, I think, yeah. I, I think the, the big, one of the big takeaways is that VR is very needy you know, in public spaces, very, very needy. It's one thing to be sitting at home, you know, with an Oculus playing Robo Recall or something if you're a nerd, but like, it's another thing to try to onboard 500 grandmas. Um, Don't the nerds. <laughs> no, I'm just saying, it's not built, you know, we need technical and sort of, technical and, and human solutions for how to use VR uh, hardware in public spaces. Because I feel kind of like the interaction is gonna get, interaction is gonna get more and more natural. You know, yeah. I test everything we'll on my five-year-old son. All yes. so natural, but like the hardware challenges, as Nicola just said, people were pulling off the headsets like this and kept on snapping the ears. Yeah, and they just like grabbed the headset by the cable and then it would come out of the socket. Oh, and one of the controllers got dropped so many times it's completely dead now. Yeah, which <laughs> so. is fine. You just we just buy new ones. But like, yeah. but these are the technical challenges that uh, that that people need to overcome. So, um, overall, after the exhibition, so we packed up and left our space. So we, we're currently uh, negotiating to re-engineer it, so to add more locations in Tudor London with more, um, with more data that we've gotten and with more historical information. And make it so much bigger. Much, make it much bigger, yeah. widen the visualisation of London around so you can wander through Tudor era London and experience different architectures and whatnot. Um, Hampton Court, Henry's Palace, yeah. um, the, you know, yeah. To visualise the world that we know about simply through this scientific experiment mm. of the data. And um, in terms of the flat pack um, built environment, so um, at iCinema, where I used to work, and I used to work all work now and then, um, they actually have um, a whole flat pack system for VR exhibitions. So we actually do have a fallback of experience that can help us out setting up that 
because it does seem a little bit daunting. But... Yeah, but the plan is to the plan is to tour it. So we want to yeah. create a kind of like a performative built environment mm -hmm. that again sort of signals to people in museums or whatever you know context that this is a play space where they can come and experience something different. Um, so that's in the works yeah. and. So this, this is, is uh, this is something that we're working on at the moment, just mm -hmm. about to finish the prototype. Um, it's uh, a massive simulation of the Second Battle of Villa Bretonneux, and we've mm -hmm. built which a, is in World War One battle World in France, mm -hmm. hundred years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, I've modelled sixty-four square kilometres of the battle using and I'm photos. And mapping it with AI on the emotions. And we're we're, build, we're building an AI-driven uh, animation engine. So what we did was trolled. Not trolled, sorry, trawled. That's better. We didn't troll the soldiers' <laughs> memories. Oh. We trawled them from a bunch of institutions. So we went through diaries in uh, Australian and French um, institutions and uh, created a kind of massive emotional database logging uh, the incidents of emotion, when they happened, where they happened. And uh, that database drives an initial animation engine yep. that Nicola's been working so on. So I made a um, shader, which is the thing you can see in that screenshot that um, basically reacts to emotion maps you feed into code um, and then has a specific set of ways it reacts. So like to anger, it's like, well, we're basically you could make it red and angry or you could make it a totally different color. I've actually got the wireframe shader itself um, up on my GitHub, which is what I was alluding to before, which you can also look at. So, but only the shader, none of the other code, because that's yes. Yeah. So the next, <laughs> the next stage is so you can wander around. So this is in this is in my lab at UNSW. Um, the visualization system is called AV. It's a ten meter diameter, five and a half there's meter tall here. cylinder. Where um, Melbourne Museum. Yeah, there's, there's, there's one, one in Melbourne, Melbourne Museum yeah. and Acme. If you guys it have shows been off there. a volcano experience. Yeah. Um, but you can wander around. They're infrared tracked. Five people, and as they find something interesting, the world will move with them. If there's a quorum of people in a certain wedge. Mm -hmm. And the next phase is to be able to get the people to feed back their responses. Mm -hmm. And so for the engine to start recording contemporary emotions in response to the historical emotions. So two, two not competing, two interacting algorithms that yeah. then modify the geometry in unexpected yeah. ways. And I work in um, VR hardware with um, biomechanical engineers who are um, quite happy to help us out with the tracking of someone's emotions in real time. So. That's pretty cool. Yep, so that's what we're working on at the moment. Yeah. Um...